very good afternoon to all and welcome back for the afternoon session so we'll start uh, with the first session for this i invite dr shubhada outset ma'am professor and head department of community medicine and she will be talking on evaluation of direct diagnostic tests madam please hello everyone may at the outset i would like to congratulate all of you for getting admission for pg course in desired subject in this renowned institute uh, myself dr shubhada outset i will be discussing the topic evaluation of diagnostic test actually this topic will be evaluate my teaching skill also and your learning skill of course because this is the first lecture in post learn session and i understand how difficult it is to concentrate on a lecture and that to on this uh, some unfamiliar topic after the lunch i have gone through that situation so i understand your feeling so let's take this opportunity and discuss the evaluation of diagnostic test so evaluation of diagnostic test in the current era of technology this is the situation a lot of cleaning a uh, lot of tests diagnostic tests are available and clinician is confused mind because of explosion of too much information which test we should choose consider a situation suppose a 50 years male visits your opd with increased frequency of maturation during night time so apart from benign enlargement of prostate the most common diagnosis which comes in our mind is diabetes so whether to advise him oral glucose tolerance test whether to advise urine sugar test or glycosylated hemoglobin or go for the blood sugar level fasting and bp which test will be accurate which test will give the uh, cost effective and of course acceptable for the patient and clinician and which whether it will be sensitive or not so lot of questions arise in our mind so let's try to find out answers of some of these questions in this session so the lesson objectives are at the end of the session the participant would be able to differentiate between diagnostic test and screening test then the participant will enlist the indicators for evaluation of a diagnostic test describe and calculate sensitivity specificity and predictive power of a test explain the criteria for selection of appropriate diagnostic test and enlist the utility of likelihood ratio roc curve and kappa statistics so what is difference between diagnostic test and screening test i have given you the case scenario that a patient 50 years patient comes with increased frequency of maturation during the night time so this this person is a having certain symptoms and clinical features so for such patients we do the diagnostic test it means that diagnostic test is done either to confirm or refute the diagnosis on a person who is having the particular signs symptoms or clinical features of that disease while screening test it is done on the asymptomatic patients all of you might be knowing that iceberg phenomena of disease whatever cases comes to our opds or hospitals just represent the tip of the iceberg while remaining submerged parts portion of the iceberg is the hidden cases in the community and these hidden cases in the community can be identified with the help of screening test so diagnostic test is offered by the health worker while uh, sorry by the patient because patient visits the health center and we are uh, doing the diagnostic test while screening test is offered by the health worker in order to find out the hidden cases in the community so this is the main difference between the diagnostic test and screening test so diagnostic test is usually done when the screening test is positive so in the same example first we do oral glucose tolerance test as a screening test and if it is significantly positive then we can go for the uh, blood sugar fasting pp or uh, glycosylated hemoglobin then it is not necessarily that diagnostic test may be invasive or it is a sort of investigation all the time sometimes if a person comes with headache dizziness above 50 years of age 
and we measure the blood pressure and we found that the person is hypertensive so here measuring of blood pressure or clinical exam it serves as a diagnostic test not necessarily that every time we will do the invasive investigation now why to perform diagnostic test what is the rationale of performing diagnostic test as i have told it is done either to confirm the diagnosis or to refute the diagnosis means either to confirm the presence of the disease or to confirm the absence of the disease sometimes the diagnostic test can be done to monitor the therapy for example under the national tuberculosis elimination program we administer dots therapy directly of the treatment and after in intensive phase is over we again do the sputum microscopy why whether what we will see whether the patient is responding to the our intensive phase of therapy if sputum sample is negative then we will go for a continuation phase if sputum sample is positive again we will think about the uh, continuation of intensive therapy so it can be done to monitor the therapy it can be done to provide the prognostic information of the therapy for example if we are treating a patient of anemia by giving iron folic acid tablets or by giving the interferon injections we monitor the patient's hemoglobin level so hemoglobin uh, estimation it serves as a diagnostic test that on the basis of which we have diagnosed anemia and even after therapy we are doing repeated hemoglobin estimation so that it will provide prognostic information whether the patient is responding to your treatment or not then diagnostic test can be done to uh, confirm that patient is free from the entity again the same example after giving completion of dots therapy again we do the sputum microscopy and if the sputum microscopy is negative then we declare that per person is a free from tuberculosis so it can be done to see whether the patient is free from that entity diagnostic test is done and of course it is done as a screening for a symptomatic uh, patient as example is oral glucose tolerance test now how the ideal diagnostic test should be it should be acceptable it should be repeatable it should be valid simple safe it should give rapid results and it should be cost effective but in reality the uh, it is very difficult to find ideal ideal friend it is very difficult to find ideal lawyer ideal doctor because we cannot get all the qualities in a single person then what we do in reality we will decide some important and essential things or criteria and if those criteria are fulfilled then we accept that person as a friend as a life partner or as a doctor so same principle can be applied for a diagnostic test there are some essential and important criteria and if these criteria are fulfilled then we can accept the diagnostic test so what are the criteria that should be importantly think for before uh, selecting the diagnostic test so important one of the important criteria is validity the components of validity are sensitivity specificity and predictive power second uh, important criteria of a diagnostic test is repeatability this repeatability is influenced by observer variation biological variation or errors due to technical methods the third essential criteria is acceptability and it is judged by its cost effectiveness and by feasibility so what do you mean by reproducibility the other names for this uh, criteria is repeatability or reliability so what is repeatability it means the test should give consistent results even after you repeat the test or even after even the other person repeats the test the results should be consistent and this is called as reproducibility or repeatability this is influenced by three factors one is subject variation say the example of taking blood pressure our blood pressure there is diagonal variation of our blood pressure there is diagonal variation of our blood sugar serum cholesterol so all the levels change because of the this is a biological factor which may influence the reproducibility or repeatability of a test second factor which affects this reproducibility is intra observer variation if the blood pressure is taken by intern if it is taken by a resident and if it is taken by a houseman every time their blood pressure differs why this often occurs 
it occurs because of the intra observer variation so it also affects the consistency or repeatability of the test third is inter observer variation blood pressure measured by two observers intra observer means same individual measuring the blood pressure at repeated times and it differs intra observer means two different persons taking the blood pressure and every time you are getting the different results so these variations occur and how to reduce these variations for example subject variation and intra observer variation we can reduce this error by taking the average <clears throat> before starting anti hypertensive therapy you take at least three readings of blood pressure of that particular person why to minimize this subject variation and intra observer variation so by taking min, uh, multiple readings and taking average of that that is one of the thing to improve this reproducibility while inter observer variation two different persons taking bp and the uh, results are different every time it can be reduced by standard operating procedures sops should be developed for each and every procedure and training of the individuals should be done so you can improve the reproducibility by training of persons you can improve the reproducibility by developing sops and by taking multiple testings and taking average of the each second criteria of this uh, diagnostic test is acceptability the test should be acceptable by the people for whom it is used and this acceptability you can assess by feedback the next criteria is feasibility and the feasibility can be assessed by cost effectiveness the test should be easy to conduct as well as it should be easy to interpret then only the test is feasible and widely acceptable and the next important criteria of a diagnostic test is validity validity is the ability of a test to indicate those who are having the disease and those who are not having the disease so another name for validity is accuracy so the ideal definition of validity it refers to what extent the test accurately measures what is supposed to measure if the test is valid means it is accurately measures what it should measure <coughs> so it is <coughs> in simple words it is ability to distinguish between disease persons and healthy persons for example glycosuria is a useful screening test uh, examining urine for sugar <coughs> is acceptable because it is non invasive it is feasible it gives rapid result but still it is not accepted as a screening test for diabetes why because it is not valid so validity is very very important criteria for selection of a diagnostic test and on that matter gluco oral glucose tolerance test it is more valid because it measures accurately the changes or variations in the blood sugar level there are two components of validity sensitivity and specificity so sensitivity means it is the ability of the test who have the disease uh, to diagnose those who are having the disease suppose <coughs> the test is <coughs> <coughs> sorry <coughs> a test is 90% sensitive means 90% true positive it means what 90% of the disease patients show positive results that is true positive while specificity means ability of the test to diagnose true negatives means those who are not having the disease a test is 90% specific it means 90% of person showing negative result for that test are not having the disease that is meaning of true negative disease is absent and test is negative so specificity measures the true negatives while the sensitivity measures the true positive a test which yields minimum false positive is more specific test so how to estimate this sensitivity and specificity so can you see it properly so test result 
if the test result is positive and disease is present it means it is true positive if test result is positive and the disease is absent it means it is <coughs> false positive if the test result is negative but the patient is having the disease it means false negative good and if the test result is negative <coughs> and disease is absent it means true negative so how to measure sensitivity it is true positive divided by true positive plus false negative <coughs> while specificity numerator is true negative divided by false positive plus true negative here you can label as a b c d a means true positive false positive means b false negative means c and true negative means d so sensitivity means a upon a plus c while specificity means d upon b uh, c plus d so if, instead of remembering that you can measure at uh, you can calculate as true positive divided by true positive plus false negative and specificity is true negative divided by false positive plus true negative now which component is preferable whether to select a test with high sensitivity or high specificity what do you mean by high sensitivity high sensitivity means they give less number of false negative test means majority of the disease persons we can diagnose with the help of highly sensitive test so it should be selected a test having high sensitivity should be selected when there is a important penalty of missing a disease if you cannot find a disease it may have very grave consequences in such situation you should select a highly sensitive test example is carcinoma of cervix if you diagnose the carcinoma of cervix at carcinoma in c2 level the prognosis or five year survival rate is nearly 80 to 100 percent means in this case you cannot afford false negative so for that matter you should select a highly sensitive test so in the cases in which early diagnosis will be improve the prognosis of a patient for such situation you go for highly sensitive test another situation is there is risk of spreading the disease means if you miss the case the disease may spread for communicable diseases like hiv aids if among the blood donors if you select a less sensitive test then there will be more false negative and the person may donate the blood and the disease may get uh, hiv may spread to number of person so in such situation also you have to go for highly sensitive test so in two situations where the prognosis can be definitely altered by early diagnosis and secondly for the sake of community when the risk of spreading the disease is more in such situations you always go for highly sensitive test now when to choose specificity for a prevalent disease like diabetes a diabetes is a lifelong disease the person has to take the life medicine right <coughs> if a person comes to you with diabetes and if you choose a test having less specificity less specificity means true negatives you cannot be find out you may get some false negative uh, i mean false positive also so the person is not having diabetes and you are giving anti diabetic drugs the person will land up into hypoglycemia so in such situation always go for a highly specific test so for a prevalent diseases or chronic diseases go for a highly specific test highly specific tests are particularly needed when false positive test can harm the patient physically or financially <coughs> for example before starting chemotherapy or chemotherapy the physician or oncologist always relies on the histopathology why because it is highly specific test there is less chance that it means true negatives are easily identified less chance of false positive results and hence the highly specific test is recommended so before <coughs> starting chemotherapy radiotherapy go for highly specific test like histopathology so depending upon the situation you have you can select a test whether to test uh, go for a test with high sensitivity or high specificity 
the next criteria is predictive value of a positive test so predictive value of positive test means probability that person will have a disease if test is positive the ppv is 90% means there is 90% chance that if the test is positive means the disease will have so this is called as predictive value power of a test and this is also one of the important criteria for a diagnostic test and how to calculate this it is true positive divided by total number of positive cases so predictive power of a test can be calculated by true positive divided by true positive plus false negative so predictive power of a positive test it reflects the diagnostic power of a test more specific the test more better will be the ppv it depends upon sensitivity specificity and prevalence of a disease so these three factors they influence the predictive power of a positive test and it is directly proportional to the prevalence of a disease in the population means if the disease is having high prevalence the ppv will be high the next is predictive power of a negative test it is the probability that person will not have the disease if the test is negative 90% ppv predictive power of negative test means 90% of the cases those who are showing negative test there is 90% probability that they are not having the disease so this is the predictive power it also depends upon the prevalence of the disease the next criteria of a diagnostic test is accuracy accuracy is measured as total positive plus true negative means sensitivity and specificity both we are considering so to total uh, true positive plus true negative divided by total number of positive plus total number of negative and it measures the accuracy of the test so in the given example true positives are 90 and true negatives are 180 so true positive plus true negative means 90 plus 180 divided by total number of positives that is 110 and 190 the next important criteria is likelihood ratio i know that these three points likelihood ratio kappa statistics and roc curve these are very much difficult and confusing but at least try to rem remember some important or significant points of these three things likelihood ratio roc curve and kappa statistics so what is likelihood ratio likelihood ratio is used to assess the potential utility of a particular diagnostic test how likely it, the patient is having the disease that you can estimate with the help of likelihood ratio this is a basically ratio of probability of the test showing correct result to the probability that the test result is incorrect so why we estimate this likelihood ratio of any diagnostic test because it measures the proportion of correct test to the proportion of uh, incorrect results so likelihood ratio of a positive test result it means the odds that a positive test result would be expected in a patient with a disease so if the patient is having the disease and how much is the probability of getting positive test in that person that is estimated by means of a likelihood ratio of a positive test and how it is calculated it is calculated as sensitivity divided by 1 minus specificity another is likelihood ratio of negative test it tests the probability of person having negative test so how much is the expectancy that person is not having the disease if the test is negative and it is calculated as 1 minus sensitivity divided by specificity so it entirely depends upon sensitivity and specificity and it does not considers the prevalence of a disease okay this predictive power of a diagnostic test it depends upon three things sensitivity specificity and the prevalence of the disease and it is directly proportional to the prevalence but the important point to be noted for likelihood ratio is that 
it only depends upon sensitivity and specificity and it doesn't consider the prevalence of a disease so it is less likely to be changed whether the disease is prevalent or not prevalent now what is the significance of likelihood ratio for example the prevalence of appendicitis in general population is only 1% but another situation is that prevalence of appendicitis in persons coming with right lower abdominal pain in a emergency department here the prevalence is 30% so in general population prevalence is less but if the person is coming with right lower abdominal pain in that persons or in those persons the uh, prevalence is 30% means here prevalence is changing so predictive power of a positive or negative test it may also change because it depends upon prevalence but in such situations you, you should go for likelihood ratio because it doesn't depend upon the prevalence of a disease so if likelihood ratio is more than 1 it indicates the presence of a disease suppose you perform a test on this patient having the right ab uh, abdominal pain and if the likelihood ratio comes more than 1 you can directly go for the treatment if the likelihood ratio is less than 1 in that situation it indicates the absence of a disease thus a test could be only useful if the likelihood ratio is either more than 1 or less than 1 if it is equal to 1 it is not much significant so what is the exact utility of likelihood ratio because the proportions according to which we calculate likelihood ratio it depends upon sensitivity and specificity it doesn't consider the prevalence and that's why as i have elaborated the example here the prevalence is changing prevalence of appendicitis is 1% in general population but it increases to 30% if the if you consider the population of uh, having the right lower abdominal pain coming to the uh, emergency department in those population it may in increase to 30% so in such situation likelihood ratio is the best uh, evaluation criteria and it scientifically backs the common and reliable a reasonable practice of relying more weight on extremely high or low results here they also consider the borderline ones the next is roc curve receiver operating characteristic curve the full form is receiver operating characteristic curve or roc curve so it is the graphical representation of relationship between sensitivity and specificity receiver operating characteristic curve it graphically represents the relation between sensitivity and specificity and why it is used it is used to compare the different diagnostic test if you want to compare whether this test is better or that test is better in that situation you go for roc curve it gives a more idea and it is also used to evaluate the performance of a test over a range of possible cutoff values for example before labeling the patient is having diabetes there is a, there are certain cutoff values set for fasting as well as bp sugar so which cutoff value we should set or we should rely on that can be determined with the help of this receiver operating characteristic curve or roc curve so if you see this diagram the x axis represents one minus specificity while y axis represents sensitivity so maximum if you want to maximize sensitivity it corresponds to some large value on y axis so if you want highly sensitive test then there will be the largest value or maximum value on y axis if you want to maximize specificity it will indicate a small small value on x axis means you cannot balance between sensitivity and specificity if you want high value of sensitivity there will be comparatively smallest value on y axis that is specificity so what will be the good first choice good first choice will be the upper left corner where both are maximum where x axis value is also maximum and y axis value is also maximum so those the cut off points which fall in this left upper quadrant that should be decided so that is the utility of this roc curve the second important component of roc curve is auc auc that is area under curve so it is important measure of accuracy of the test 
if area under curve is main so one here also x axis means sensitivity and y axis means one minus specificity so if highly accurate test means area under curve is one which is indicated by the blue bold line so if auc is one that is ideal test if area under curve is 0.5 it is represented by the diagonal curve so it indicates that the test cannot discriminate between the disease and non disease persons so that is not much useful test so auc is one that is maximum or optimistic test while aec is 0.5 it means the test is not much discriminating between normal and abnormal so this is the utility of roc curve one is to decide the cut off points and secondly this area under curve here you can compare between the two diagnostic tests which is better the third component is agreement when we are com uh, comparing the results of a diagnostic test with gold standard as for example Uh, histopathology is a gold standard because it is highly specific and sensitive my pap smear if you want to compare the results of pap smear with say histopathology here the agreement criteria is useful how much is the agreement between the positive and negative results of both these tests and if the results are dichotomous in that situation you can use the coppa statistics so <clears throat> selection of a diagnostic test while selecting a diagnostic test you should select a appropriate test which should be dependent upon the use of the results so for kappa statistics i have uh, specifically omitted those slides how to calculate these kappa values but remember that if the kappa values are more than 0.5 it indicates there is a good agreement and if the kappa statistics values are less than 0.5 it means the agreement is not proper and kappa statistics it is calculated based on the observed values and expected value of a particular test so how to select a diagnostic test the selection of appropriate diagnostic test depends upon the intended use of the results if our intention is to rule out a disease for example we uh, uh, we want to rule out uh, hiv aids among the pregnant lady here we select highly sensitive test because reliable negative results are required reliable negative results because we cannot tolerate false positive so in that situation highly sensitive tests are used example is mammography by mammography you can diagnose means rule out the disease if mammography is negative means breast cancer is less likely so you go for highly sensitive test if it is desired to confirm our diagnosis or if you want a confirmation and evidence that disease has to be present means ruling in so if you want to rule in a disease in that situation highly specific tests are recommended for example if you want to start anti retroviral therapy then you cannot rely only on elisa test because it is highly sensitive but less specific while western blot test is highly specific means there are More, or true negatives means those who are not having the disease they are directly eliminated so and you can start the anti retroviral therapy so specificity is recommended or if you want to start radiotherapy or chemotherapy for breast cancer patient you require highly specific test means you are ruling in the disease means you are confirming the disease you are collecting the evidence of disease so in such situation histopathology having which is having high specificity is recommended so depending upon intention whether you want to rule out the disease go for sensitive test highly sensitive test if you want to collect the evidence that disease is present then go for highly specific test so as a general rule of thumb a test with at least 95% sensitivity and 75% specificity it should be used to rule out a disease while if you want to rule in a disease then 95% specificity and 75% sensitivity means highly specific test is recommended if you want to rule in a disease and in conclusion i will like to say that before diagnosing a disease before treating a patient there should be always cooperation and 
consideration of everyone's opinion clinical coordination as well as investigative coordination everything is required so everyone's job is important clinician pathologist epidemiologist so alone we cannot diagnose and treat the patient it is a team work and we should act as a health team so lastly i will say evaluation of a diagnostic test can make you mentally strong or strongly mentally thank you Uh, thank you, ma'am. Any questions? Uh, any questions? Because uh, uh, especially the pathology and radiology, whatever the most of the thesis that we have seen, the dissertation that you do, they are based on certain tests, comparison of the different diagnostic tests. So, if you have any queries, especially the uh, pathology the residents from the pathology and radiology department because what we have seen is their thesis their dissertation is mainly related to the comparison of the diagnostic tests <clears throat> so if you have any queries you can ask ma'am yes okay thank you ma'am Okay, so the next uh, we have the uh, group activity. Okay, as I told you in the uh, morning session also, we'll again give you some time to discuss among yourselves and finalize about this group activity, and then we will have the presentation of each group. So each group have to uh, formulate one research question and its related hypothesis. Then you have to tell whether the research question fulfills the final criteria. then formulate the objectives for the given research question then as you have also learn about the different types of studies okay what are the descriptive case control cohort studies so what type of study will be required to answer this research question and why the reasons and indicate the population in which this study will be undertaken like in which population in which group you will conduct this study so you have to answer these questions so again we'll give you uh, some time uh, or 10 to 15 minutes okay so all of you be prepared and one group will present uh, each group uh, turn by turn they will present and others we will discuss we will have a discussion on the research question and whatever the finding whatever the discussion that has been taken place we will have a discussion on that okay so if we'll give you we'll start at 3 okay
Okay. A very good afternoon to everybody. Can we begin? Okay. So I am Dr. Mrs. Shraddha Gunza, and I am here to discuss types of variables, scales of measurement, data editing, and data grouping with you all. So let's move ahead. So these are the learning objectives. So at the end of our discussion, we all would be able to define what is a variable or what are variables, what are different types of variables, how variable creates a data or what is data, what are the different types of data, what are the measurement scales for the variables, and lastly, data editing and data grouping. Okay, so in this session, we will be having a sensitization to all these following topics. So to have a very small introduction, so we all know what is a research, okay? So research is just a search and search and search again and again, maybe on the same thing to come more close to the truth, okay? We want to find out something, we are interested in something, we take the references, okay? We read them, we learn something from the references, but still we want to move ahead with the same thing, okay? So that is research. We search and search and search to go as far as possible, more closer to the truth that we are looking for. Okay, so it leads to a critical thinking to find out facts, answers to the questions that we have and probably solutions to the problems that we've created. Okay, so we are looking in the same thing again and again and again, so that we start thinking on what we want to find out. Okay, what truth we want to reach. We start thinking critically about it, okay, to find out what is the fact. And we need to know the answers to the questions those have arised in our minds. So, when we do all this, we try to make certain observations. We observe something, we look for something. Or we make certain measurements. We try to measure something, count something, okay. And during this process, what we gather is data. We count something, we measure something, okay, on certain scales, on some scales, and then we create a data. So, therefore, these measurements, those we are making, they should be correctly planned, executed, and recorded, okay? Then and then only, the final outcome would be good. What is the final outcome? We want to collect everything. We want to collect the information. We want to do the measurements correctly, execute them and record them properly so that out of this, a nice or a good or a clean data is generated from which we get some piece of good information. Okay, we take out this information and we think critically and then it leads to solving our problems and questions. Okay, <clears throat> so coming to what are variables now, this variable is defined as anything that has some quality and quantity and that varies, okay. There has to be attached some quality to that variable or some quantity which will keep on changing, which needs to be changed. This is one thing. And secondly, it's, it, it should be measurable. It needs to be measured on some or the other scale. What scale? We'll come to it, okay? So it needs to vary, it needs to have certain quality and quantity, and it needs to be measurable. These are important aspects which should be associated with any variable that we are interested in. So these <clears throat> measurements of variables generate data or values to the variables or going the other way around, the data are records. What are these data? These are records to measurements, observations, or simply these are certain counts. We count something. <clears throat> 
okay we count the weight we count the hemoglobin level etc count something now these data are raw material for statistical work okay so this is what is the outcome we collect the data which is statistically worked out okay which will give a good reliability to our study okay and which can be more generalized that is more important this generalizability of our observations should be more so that it is important to every person in the community of course always it may not be possible but as far as possible we need to have something which can be measured which is measured rather properly and which is statistically worked out to its most correct form okay then we will say that our findings are reliable correct and then we will say that okay because these are reliable we can make them more generalized isn't it so that is what we are doing in the entire procedure for example suppose we have a spreadsheet or a data sheet like this okay so from here what we have done we have all these variables now now you have you are now sensitized to what is a variable okay so it is a quality or quantity it varies and it can be measured so in this column all these are different variables okay for which some readings or some recordings are made like this in these two columns okay the second and the third this will create a data out of which we will have the information now looking at this what information we are collecting or gathering for example like we have a male and a female okay this female this has uh she is of 11 years she has a history of fever palpitation dyspnea hemoptysis precordial pain presently she is suffering from fever she has hepatosplenomegaly and she has a mid diastolic murmur so looking at this what information we are collecting that this is probably a case of rheumatic mitral stenosis okay so because the variables are planned correctly and they are measured on a correct scale we could come to this final outcome okay like this this is just an example we can move on and on and on and this spreadsheet can be just continued okay which will give us a huge piece of information and finally we can just work out statistically and come to a more correct conclusion that yes are these findings relevant to uh, rheumatic mitral stenosis or does it vary does it change isn't it okay so like this we can plan or select the variables and the scales of measure now coming to the different types of variables what are the different types of variables so we have 10 different type of variables independent dependent intervening moderating extraneous confounding control qualitative quantitative and composite okay so these are the different types of the variables so let's begin with the first two types dependent and the independent they are just opposites to each other so we have explained it in one slide okay. so we have a dependent variable which is <clears throat> uh this is uh, like uh, antecedent and the uh, dependent variable would go the consequent the effect of which okay now this variable is one that could be manipulated whereas the other cannot be manipulated okay the independent one is a predictor and the dependent one is the outcome okay this one the independent one is a presumed cause it is the cause which is having some effect okay the presumed effect or simply independent is a uh, sorry dependent is a stimulus whereas the other one is the response we'll just try to uh, understand it through this example for example we have generated or we have a research question like does exercise reduce obesity to this we have formed an objective like to determine the role of 30 minutes brisk walk in weight loss okay now in this we have an independent variable like exercise okay this is what we want to understand what is the effect of exercise in weight loss so weight is a dependent variable weight will be the 
effect of this cause cause is the exercise and effect would be the weight cause uh, exercise would be the stimulus and to response would be weight loss okay so this would be considered as an independent variable whereas weight would be considered as a dependent variable coming to other example suppose we have a research question like does iron rich food improve hemoglobin okay for this we had an objective for example like to determine the role of consuming 100 grams of green leafy vegetables daily in improving the hemoglobin okay so here we have iron rich food which is an independent variable that we are not changing this is the stimulus that we are giving and to that the response is there will be some change in the hemoglobin level so that hemoglobin would be the dependent variable okay the cause and effect relationship should be understood fine can we move to the next slide yes okay. next is the intervening or the mediating variable it excuse me it explains a cause or connection between dependent and independent variables okay what is the connection between these two can be explained again for example we have the same research question so does exercise reduce obesity objective was to determine the role of 30 minutes walk in weight loss so here we have an independent variable that is exercise and the dependent variable that is weight loss weight loss is uh, weight is going to change okay so weight will vary and the intervening variable would be 30 minutes of swimming the same effect weight loss would also be present if the person is doing 30 minutes swimming first okay so that would be an intervening variable helping to achieve the effect it is helping no it is coming in the middle it is intervening the effect what is the effect of our interest the person should have weight loss to reduce obesity okay so although exercise is going to do that 30 minutes walk is going to do that but if the person is also doing swimming for 30 minutes that would also have the same effect correct so this would be the intervening variable which should be kept in mind while having the planning of our study next research question we take the same example does iron rich food improve hemoglobin the objective was to determine the role of consuming 100 grams of green leafy vegetables daily in improving hp so here we have the independent variable that is iron rich food and the dependent would be hemoglobin to this the intervening variable would be maybe the person is taking some iron supplements okay so that intervenes in increasing or improving the hemoglobin level okay so at the end of it would your results be more stuck to what you are trying to find no your results are also influenced by the intervening variable correct you have a dependent and an independent variable but in between this intervening variable is also there so should it be present no okay so this variable should be thought of and as far as possible should be kept down so that the final outcome or the final result that you are having is more close to what you want to find out isn't it you want to find out the effect of exercise in weight loss so if you keep away 30 minutes swimming then you will be more close to what you are finding you want you are finding uh, effect of walking for 30 minutes in weight loss so you'll be more close to that okay so likewise your research question and the objective should be planned and the variable should be kept in mind <clears throat> next is the moderating variable so a moderating or a moderator variable changes the relationship between dependent and independent variable by strengthening or weakening the intervening variables effect example again the same question okay same objective to determine the role of 30 minutes brisk walk in weight loss so here we have independent variable exercise dependent variable weight gain or weight loss sorry weight loss 
then we have an intervening variable 30 minutes of swimming and the moderating variable would be rather the frequency of swimming okay maybe the person is practicing swimming twice daily okay so practicing swimming twice daily is influencing the effect of 30 minutes swimming okay it is moderating or it is strengthening or weakening the effect of your intervening variable and so this 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 in uh, you know uh, as a result will change the relationship between your cause and effect okay Next question, again, we have the same research question. Does our enriched food improve hemoglobin objective is to determine the role of consuming 100 grams of green leafy vegetables daily in improving DHP? Here we have independent variable. We have iron-enriched food. Hemoglobin would be the dependent variable. Iron supplements would be the intervening variable. And the moderating variable would be intake of calcium. Okay, if the person is also taking calcium at the same time, that will not allow iron supplements to increase the hemoglobin. Okay, so that is weakening the relationship between your cause and effect. Okay, so this should be kept out. And now when you are planning the planning to study the effect of eating green leafy vegetables, rest all of the variables, iron supplements, calcium you should say that your participant should not have all these. Then and then only in correct sense, we would be able to study whether green leafy vegetables would have increase in hemoglobin. Isn't it? Next is extraneous variable. So extraneous variables are factors that affect the dependent variable, but that the researcher did not originally consider when designing the experiment. And these are unwanted things in your research. Okay, so extraneous variable is something which is really unwanted. Okay, and if extraneous variable is not taken care of, the same thing can become a confounding variable. A confounding variable will have a disguise effect or a negative effect rather on the study. Okay. Your whole study, the outcome of the study would be interpreted as wrong. Okay. So this confounding variable should be removed. So for the above two research questions, <clears throat> we have exercise as the independent variable, weight as the dependent variable, and the extraneous variable may be, although the person is exercising, although the pace person is having or the participant is having weight loss, but we didn't consider that the person is also having pizza twice a week. So that would be something which will get your study into a negative sign. Okay. So rather than having a weight loss, a person will have weight gain. Okay, and if not removed, if not thought of and removed on time, the same thing will result into a confounding variable, which will at the end of it, after completing your study, you will have a negative side, you will move to a negative side, and that will act as a confounding variable. Correct? Okay. <clears throat> and in the next example, to determine the role of consuming 100 grams of green leafy vegetables daily, improving hemoglobin, your iron-rich food is the independent variable, then your hemoglobin levels would be the dependent variable, but the extraneous variable would be poor compliance. Although you have told your patient that you have to, uh, sorry, not patient, participant, although you have told your participant that you have to consume iron-rich food, but the participant is not doing it with the proper compliance. Sometimes he or she has it, sometimes he or she doesn't have it. So that is something which is extraneous. So we should <clears throat> tell the participant to have a good compliance. And if not taken care of, or if he or she is not following it properly, it will be acting as a confounding variable. And finally, at the, at the end of it, maybe your study lasts for about six months. So after six months, you are not going to have the correct results. So you are not going to go closer to the truth. You are going to divert. You are going to vary. Okay. 
So these are confounding variables. Then control variables. <clears throat> these control or controlling variables are characteristics. Those are kept constant or unchanged during the study because they influence the outcome. Okay, like we can just have the earlier example. We can have this <clears throat> poor compliance as a control variable. We need to control it. Okay, so rather your extraneous or confounding variable can be acting as a control variable. Okay, we need to tell the participant that okay, this, this, this is at this, this date, at this, this time you are supposed to eat whatever we are telling you to eat. Okay, so it should be controlled because it has some effect on the cause and effect relationship. Next is qualitative or categorical variable. The qualitative or categorical variables are non-numerical values or groupings. These are words, some characteristics. For example, eye and hair color. They cannot be counted. Okay, they, that is just a characteristic. It is a different attribute. Then we have the quantitative variables. So quantitative variables are any data sets that involves numbers or amounts. Okay, we can count it. Okay, for example, uh, height, weight, distance, these are quantitative variables. Then composite variable, last, a composite variable is two or more variables combined to make a more complex variable. For example, overall health is an example of a composite variable. Okay, in any study, if we are planning to see a health status of the patient, and we, we are just commenting on the overall health. So that would be taken as a composite variable because overall, all health would be a very <clears throat> broad or, uh, or we can take it into a very broader sense. Okay, but it has certain other parameters, defining parameters also. Okay, so this is an example of composite variable. Next, coming to the types of data. Okay, so we have qualitative and quantitative data. So again, qualitative data is when information is not in numerical, but it is recorded as attributes like gender, blood groups, the outcome of treatment. Say, for example, the patient has recovered or not recovered. Okay, then the satisfaction level satisfied to the treatment, yes, no. Okay, so these are characteristics, these are words. Okay, so such data is recorded in words, not in numbers. And quantitative data, when the information is collected in mathematical figures, like the blood pressure, it has some figures, it has some counts, and the body weight, then other biochemical parameters like serum levels, etc. Okay, these are counts. Since such data is recorded in the form of numerals, it is also called as numerical data. The quantitative data is also called as numerical data. Okay, coming to the scales of measurements, the more popular classification or the types of scales of measurements are nominal, ordinal, interval, and ratio scales. These are the four scales. Apart from this, the scales can also be measured or classified as Depending on the type of data, we have the qualitative and the quantitative. The qualitative data can be measured on scales like nominal dichotomous, nominal polychotomous, and polychotomous ordinal, whereas the quantitative data can be discrete or numerical, numerical continuous, and numerical ordinal. Okay, but more popularly, it is nominal, ordinal, interval, and ratio. So let's see what are these. So we have a nominal scale. So the major scale of recording here in the nominal scale is categorical characteristics. Okay. Example, blood groups, gender, outcome of treatment, like recovered or the response would be recovered, not recovered. This scale has certain characteristic but doesn't have any numerical meaning. It defines identity, property, of the data. Okay, it will just define the property. Okay. The data can be placed into different categories, but it is not possible to measure the difference between the data. Okay, This data can cannot be multiplied, divided, added, or subtracted. If your answers are yes or no, can you add up 
or will it have any mathematical sense if you are adding up all yes 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 all no 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 or all yes no no it has no mathematical value you know meaning as such so this nominal can be nominal dichotomous where there are only two possible alternatives dichotomous okay so like is your participant hypertensive yes or no okay living status of your participant life or dead is your participant a tobacco user yes no okay response to the treatment has your participant recovered not recovered there are two possibilities we can plan it the other way but this is because we are having the example of nominal dichotomous we have planned it in this way there are two alternatives we give two alternatives okay this all depends on the investigator how that investigator wants to plan out the study on what scale then we have nominal polychotomous there are more than two possible alternatives like for example we have the blood groups so more than two a b o a okay your n number of participants will fall into different categories so accordingly we have the percentages worked out this is just a hypothetical example so these are just hypothetical percentages to complete the chart next we have the ordinal scale we finished with the nominal now we are coming to the ordinal scale it involves ranking of objects from highest to lowest we are giving ranks categories okay rank wise grade wise ordinal scale can be applied to qualitative as well as quantitative data so we have the numerical ordinal okay so numerical ordinal is applied to quantitative data it uses numerical symbols for recording data but these numbers do not have any meaningful mathematical relationship although these are numbers these are numbers just assigned as symbols to certain characteristics so they will not have any mathematical uh, you know relationship as such or any mathematical meaning as such for example having healthy diet will help to maintain good health okay this is a question so we just take the opinion of let's say 10 different people <clears throat> so we have given numbers okay numerical symbols for recording the data so what we want to assess okay so we are assessing over here the status of healthy diet in maintaining good health so the opinion wise we have said that to this if a person strongly disagrees it's one to this if a person disagrees it's two if a person is neutral it's three if the person agrees it's 4 if the person strongly agrees it's 5 okay these are just symbol we have given do they really have any standard mathematical meaning to it no okay so the response would be recorded as for one one person is responding for two one person is responding for three three people have responded four one person has responded and five four people have responded okay so this scale is called as likert scale it can be on five point the example is of five point or we can have it on seven point also okay seven uh, these things are given so that was the example of numerical ordinal okay ordinal data presented in a numerical or number on a likert scale next is polychotomous ordinal also called as nominal with order your ordinal scale is applied to qualitative data okay ordinal variables are recorded in words instead of numbers the earlier was words are symbolized as numbers here instead of numbers characteristics are there to which words are formed okay we are giving words for example Uh, okay so here there are more than two possible alternatives again for example we record the grades of fever so the grades of fever are no fever mild moderate or high grade fever or severe fever okay here we are giving words to record the data you will have 
response is like five participants have responded to no fever three maybe to mild maybe one to moderate and maybe one to see this is how you are going to collect the data okay next or the third scale is the interval scale this allows to specify how far the interval are from each other okay the exact difference between the variables could be denoted okay here the zero is an existing variable when we say zero it means something okay <clears throat> and here only mean and median central tendencies can be derived i guess we have not done this but in the but next uh, session we will be uh, coming to uh, uh, these central tendencies so in this interval scale we have some intervals which are defined for example when we say when a temperature is recorded from 1 degrees fahrenheit to 10 degrees fahrenheit or from 1 degrees fahrenheit to 2 degrees fahrenheit the difference between this slot is standard from 2 to 3 it is standard okay so that is on intervals then we have the ratio scale this is the highest yes yes sagit pehle yes ek 15 20 minute ka theek ho numbers this will give us the absolute magnitude yes thank you black point yes sir yes sir okay the exact number oh yes sir they are the injection dum the 5.5 la the ratio the averages can be calculated injection hai na okay. so mean mode median everything can like nahi jo hai do nahi hai gap lag raha hai multiplied divided जो चार्ट सीन ना so according to this that chart this interval and ratio data can be for the discrete or numerical scale okay they can be on a discrete or a numerical scale so here a discrete or a numerical scale means information is recorded that corresponds with a count of some sort of course and they are recorded as integer number this is important okay they don't have a decimal place Okay, one point one, no, one point two, no. It is not recorded like this. It is recorded as one, two, three. Okay, the numbers have a definite mathematical relationship. <clears throat> For example, we have this uh, numerical scale. Like, suppose we have a data sheet. For uh, say n number of people, okay, we have the patients particular or rather the participants particular. Yeah, we we may have the name, registration number, etc. And we want to see the number of episodes of hemoptysis. So, can these uh, number of episodes of hemoptysis counted as two point one, two point four? No, they cannot be. They need to be discrete. They need to be integers okay so here we have they uh, that data to be recorded as the number of episodes of hemoptysis is 2 4 3 so on and so forth okay so this is a discrete or a numerical scale for the data then we have a numerical continuous here the difference is that the recordings are done in decimals okay for example suppose one wants to take a systolic blood pressure so we have the values like the blood pressure can also be taken as a discrete number like 119 120 122 120. it can also be taken into decimal places like 119.5 or to be much more precise it can also be taken as 119.539750 provided the investigator wants to do that okay and a more precise instrument is Okay, so that this scale, point scale, decimal, that is numerical continuous. 
Okay, now coming to the hierarchy. So with this, we have finished with the four different types of scales of measurements. Okay, the nominal, ordinal, interval and ratio scales. And here we are coming to the hierarchy of the information that we are gathering after having all these scales. So we have the nominal data to the lowest because it is the weakest because the words do not have any mathematical relationship. Isn't it? Okay. So here, this type is the weakest. Then we move on. Ordinal is a little stronger. Interval is a little bit more stronger. And ratio is the most strongest type of data that we are going to collect because it is going to be collected in numbers along with decimals. Maybe. Okay. So that will give us a much more mathematical meaning. The statistical workout would be much more sensible or much more correct. And finally, the reliability of your study will be good and generalizability could be possible. of data scale. When we are planning a study, we need to take into account the different things like what research question we want to find out. To that research question, what are the objectives that we have uh, drafted? What are the variables of our interest? Okay, related to the objectives, what variables are we going to study? And what will be the subsequent statistical analysis that we have to do so that the final outcome is much more correct? Okay, for example, here suppose we have a research question Is the type of respiratory disease influenced by episode of hemoptysis? Okay, so here the variable of interest would be number of episodes of hemoptysis. So the appropriate scale would be discrete numbers. That is the early example we have seen, like two episodes, four episodes, six episodes. That would be more correct. But if we take it onto the another scale, if we try to take it onto the another scale, say for example, we have we are trying to take it in a numerical scale. Will it be possible? No, it is not possible to have a 2.5. Or if we take it into another inappropriate scale, like is hemoptysis present or absent? Hemoptysis is there? Yes or no? Will it generate or will it have no correct measurements? No. Although this is partially correct, yes or no would be partially correct, but it is not going to give you the exact number. Your research, uh, your objective of the study is to record the number. So your objective is diverted. Okay. So you need to take into consideration what objective you have and what variable you are studying. What is the variable of interest? Depending on that, you have to select the most appropriate scale which would be able to have a much more correct statistical analysis. Okay. Next example, does exercise reduce obesity? Okay. The objective was to determine the number or the, oh, sorry, this number is a mis mistake. Apologies for that. To determine the role of 30 minutes walk in weight loss. Okay. So here the variable of interest is body weight, of the study participant, what is the weight? So weight, it will be more appropriate to measure the weight or to record the weight in a ratio or a numerical continuous scale like 20.2 to 0 kgs or 30.30 kgs. Okay. If we move on to maybe even, you know, uh, a discrete scale, numerical discrete scale. For example, the weight is measured as 20 kgs, 30 kgs. Although weight is measured, you are partially correct, but the final data will be not coming or not getting you towards the truth that you want. Okay, so here the most appropriate scale would be a ratio. Okay, or a numerical continuous scale in which you are putting the decimal also. So when you are planning your study, all these things should be taken into account because once you have completed it, then you have no scope to manipulate it. Okay, so the scale on which you are going to measure the data should be properly understood and comprehended and applied. Now this example, it would be inappropriate if we take it into a nominal dichotomous scale. For example, body weight. 
वॉज इट अप्रोप्रिएट और वॉज इट ओबीस ऐसे अगर दो डाल दोगे तो योर रिकॉर्डिंग वुड बी नॉट बी प्रॉपर देन अगेन इट वुड बी इन अप्रोप्रिएट टू हैव अ नॉमिनल पॉलीकॉटम स्केल लाइक द वेट इज एक्सट्रीमली लेस लेस अप्रोप्रिएट और ओबीस दिस वुड बी एन ऑर्डनेंस ओके तो लाइक दिस यू सिलेक्ट then we come to the data editing in data editing we check for the completeness of the data accuracy illegal entries outliers and the improbable entries okay the blanks nils i don't know should be corrected when you collect the information you will be entering it most probably into excel ms excel jo aata hai mostly we use that okay so in that we should check all these blanks means i don't knows and you should have answers to these okay we should be removed as far as possible accuracy can be checked like sample checks okay sample does the sample has a certain fixed number or were you supposed to collect 100 samples and you have collected 101 so what you have to do about this 101st sample i am going to include it exclude it okay then standardizations if you are doing any procedures that procedures need to be standardized you need to take care of the illegal entries like for example entries those which are not expected to be there like suppose we are violating the inclusion criteria if your inclusion criteria says that your participant should lie between age group of 10 to 20 so you should take care that all the entries those are made are between the age group of 10 to 20 if it is participant is of 25 or 30 years then you need to have the answer for that okay then improbable entries like cause of death is rupture of uterine wall this is not acceptable okay then four living children to a girl age 15 not acceptable you should have answers to this okay then we have the outliers sometimes there are some extreme values those are it Okay, so that should be taken care of. and of course the blanks needs don't know those can be checked the range is what is the minimum and the maximum range of your recording that needs to be checked the counts the count check total sub totals okay check it properly at the end of it and the validation check validation at the entry stage in ms excel and finally we have the data grouping or data reduction whatever information we have it can be tabulated properly and grouped properly okay a more elaborate data will you know have some uh, what we say uh, it 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 won't be properly you know analyzed statistically okay so it is recommended that less than 5 and more than 15 category should not be addressed if we have 15 different information sets if we have 15 different groups of 15 different tables it is more possible that you divert or you get confused okay actually what we wanted to start okay and in that the statistical workout may be not be appropriate bahut zyada ho jayega so you will be confused okay so whatever you are collecting it should be just produced or grouped or tabulated accordingly what objective you have and accordingly you group it or tabulate okay and finally although this is not a part of our uh, discussion today but whatever data we have it can be further or it rather is very important that it needs to be statistically worked out so jo data hai that would be having a rate ratio proportion okay or we may have some central tendencies like the arithmetic mean geometric mean median okay then we may have measures of variation like range interval range standard deviation varying variance percentile and the 95% confidence interval so all the statistical work out can be done properly if your data is collected properly if the variables are selected properly if the scale of measurement is appropriate okay if the data is checked properly and or tabulated all this will be 
more easy and more meaningful. Okay. Thank you. दूसरे छोटे छोटे बच्चे वो क्या रोते है क्या एक ऊपर जाके आशे कितना आ रहा है घर मैं चाहे तो दवा देता लेकिन वो तकलीफ तो बहुत है ना एक एक मिनट का रुक रुकने का रुकता है क्या आशे आने का रुकता है तो मैं अभी देख रहा हूँ on behalf of our research cell i would like to thank you madam for their uh, excellent presentation it is again important topic as per as understanding is concerned they can you all have to all uh, present this variable at the time of your synopsis presentation in ethical committee so it is very important topic and madam has delivered in very simple and lucid uh, way hope you understand if you are awake <laughs> because you don't have any questions to madam and it is very i think it is very simple topic and it is very understandable madam has presented in very understandable way and you all you all i have to all present in ethical committee regarding what is your uh, what is your variables what is your scale of measurement so it is very important topic okay and you have to mention in your synopsis also okay thank you madam for your presentation now i request uh, dr bharat kumar and dr zahir muzawar ne uh, for next session Okay. Thank you.